morning, everyone. So it's uh, 7 a.m. So we'll go ahead and get started. So Sean, take it away. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, this morning, we're gonna discuss the approach to managing below knee venous disease. Uh, in the past, treatment of below knee venous disease may have been avoided for multiple reasons, uh, based on false assumptions that there was little clinical benefit in treating below knee disease. Limited treatment options uh, you know, were available in the past and the risk of complications are heightened. But nowadays we have evidence-based medicine showing clinical benefits of below knee treatment and procedure modalities that safely and effectively address below knee venous insufficiency. So addressing below knee venous disease may include the treatment of the following, uh, disease GSVs, SSVs, tributaries, varicosities, and perforator vessels. You also may encounter below the knee disease in various clinical scenarios. One, in patients early in their disease process. Two, in patients that had previous above the knee treatment, but their distal disease was left untreated. And three, in patients with recurrent disease. Patients early in their disease process may present initially with below knee segmental GSV reflux. In a retrospective study published online last year from the University of Istanbul, 787 lower limbs of patients with venous insufficiency were studied looking at reflux patterns of the greater saphenous vein. The GSV reflux was classified into four types seen here. The two types uh, on the left side of the screen, types one and two, represented approximately 25% of the limbs studied, showing that GSV disease may originate below the knee in a quarter of individuals. Of note, these types of GSV, or this type of GSV disease was also associated with younger adults, thinner patients, and early seat classifications. A second scenario often encountered are patients who have had above the knee reflux treated, but their below knee disease was left untreated. Why was the below the knee disease left untreated? Well, there's a high risk of saphenous nerve neuritis associated with below knee GSV ablation if done with thermal ablation techniques. Secondly, some doctors feel that below the knee disease will become clinic, uh, clinically insignificant if above the knee disease is addressed. And lastly, it's estimated one third of below the knee GSV segments are tortuous, thus not suitable for traditional treatment methods um, especially the thermal modalities. So leaving behind below the knee incompetent GSV segments after thermal ablation or uh, stripping oftentimes results in recurrent varicosities and symptomatic patients. In fact, treating above the knee disease only clinically suppresses below the knee reflux in less than half of limbs where there is a fully incompetent GSV present. In a study out of Brazil from 2016, patients with fully incompetent GSVs were treated above the knee only, and the untreated below the knee GSV reflux was then examined at one month, six month, and one year post-ablation. Although 70% of below the knee reflux normalized at one month post-ablation, after one year, the reflux had returned in 70% of these limbs. In addition, greater than one second of GSV reflux below the knee was shown to lead to the development of symptomatic tributaries in almost 90% of patients. And studies show by treating this below the knee disease, patients develop fewer residual varicosities over time, thus reducing the need for secondary treatments. And patients also experience not only better relief of their symptoms, but symptom relief is achieved more quickly as well. So is it safe to treat below the knee venous disease? Well, these days there's numerous modalities to safely treat below the knee venous disease with a little knowledge of what to watch out for, which we'll discuss further. However, using foam sclerotherapy injection into the distal GSV at the same time of ablating the um, GSV above the knee has been proven safe and effective for over 10 years. In more recent years, below the knee GSV thermoablation was demonstrated to be safe as well. 
And now with new non-thermal treatment modalities that have come into the market over the past five to 10 years, there's no good excuse really not to address below the knee venous disease. You can safely treat below the knee GSVs with all modalities if you know what to watch for. So let's begin by discussing the thermal ablations, which are time-tested effective methods for closing below the knee GSV segments. There's a few things I've practiced over the years when there were no non-thermal uh, modality options available or when insurances only permit thermal ablation as a treatment option for below the knee disease. Uh, one thing, I prefer to access the GSV no lower than at the level of the distal gastroc muscle to avoid saphenous nerve injury. I also prefer to only apply heat to the proximal segment of the calf GSV and then foam the distal and mid segments in the same sitting. <clears throat> For many patients, I use a three centimeter RF catheter to heat the most proximal part of the calf GSV where the vessel is most dilated and where there's adequate soft tissue to minimize discomfort from giving the tumescent or uh, subsequently heating uh, the vein closed. Then I will foam the distal or mid GSV at the same time. Keep in mind for segments 10 centimeters or more, a seven centimeter RF catheter can be used, but for segments from six centimeters to 10 centimeters, you're gonna wanna use a three centimeter RF catheter. And for, uh, segments less than six centimeters, a laser fiber can be used by uh, using a five French introducer or a 16 gauge needle to cannulate the vessel. With RF, I also sometimes only perform half cycles, meaning I'll apply maybe 10 seconds of heat as opposed to a full 20 seconds of heat. If the vessel's real small or if I'm concerned with thermal burns or if the patient, um, I'm concerned that the patient may feel some of the, the heat. Another technique to consider is access distally, but only apply heat to ablate the proximal calf. And then through the catheter or the introducer, you can uh, administer foam into the distal and mid uh, calf segments. So three things to consider with below the knee thermal ablation. First, saphenous nerve injury. The saphenous nerve is in close proximity to the GSV at two locations, at the knee, and in the distal two thirds of the lower leg. So I kind of consider the safe zone for GSV thermal ablation to be no higher than the gastroc and no lower than the gastroc. So injury to the saphenous nerve can result in numbness either along the anterior shin or the medial distal leg, depending on the level of the nerve injury. There's no motor deficit with saphenous nerve injury and the sensory deficits tend to improve over time but patients will forever complain about having some type of nerve damage after treatment. Uh, the second concern with utilizing heat to close below the knee GSV is thermal burns due to the GSV being more superficial below the knee. So I often use tumescent fluid to push any superficial GSV away from the dermis. And then lastly, some GSVs can run very anterior close to the tibial bone and getting adequate anesthesia um, can be very challenging. So it can sometimes be a more painful experience for the patient. So keep these in mind. For those reasons, below the knee GSV disease is often untreated. However, this is where our non-thermal modalities can be extremely useful if allowable by insurance. In fact, these days, 20% of all ablations performed on Medicare patients are of the non-thermal, non-tumescent uh, I actually prefer these to thermal closures if permitted by insurance for any below the knee um, GSV disease. Um, I don't worry about nerve injury if we're using these alternative treatments and uh, they're great for patients who are needle phobic or have a low pain tolerance. For isolated below knee GSV reflux, I also prefer Varathena over ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Varathena is more effective at closing larger, larger diameter veins, and it also has a better long-term closure rate and less side effects uh, due to its low nitrogen content. In uh, one study after foam sclerotherapy of the GSV, five-year closure rates were only about 26%. Um, treatment failure was seen more commonly in obese patients and patients on anticoagulation, so keep that in mind. Uh, the DVT risk between the two is very comparable. Um, 
But a lot of these DVTs uh, below the uh, the knee can be small, uh, segmental, and non-occlusive. So a lot of these DVTs provoked by foam or varathena um, are really clinically insignificant, and they can be monitored with serial uh, sonograms. So this video here. So here's a video of below the knee GSV ablation using varathena. Um, we elevated the, the patient's uh, leg on the wedge here. Uh, perforator vessels were marked. And the reflux in this uh, gentleman, the GS, uh, was in the GSV in the mid calf to the knee. So we anesthetize the skin. Um, and then we're going to use a five French introducer kit to cannulate the GSV. I inserted the guide wire and um, I'll follow it up to make sure it doesn't detour into the deep system through a perforator here. And then I do not use a scalpel prior to inserting the introducer because the introducer really slides nicely uh, through the needle track. And then when I dispense the varathena, I, I usually um, draw up in this case, you know, two, three, maybe four cc's of varathena at any one time. Um, the vein tends to spasm once the varathena hits the vein and a little goes a long way. I'll also slowly inject about a half a cc at a time and follow the varathena. In this case, I don't have to put pressure uh, on the perforator uh, since the area of treatment was proximal and my introducer was placed above the perforator as well. So for both Varathena in ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy, the incidence of post-procedure DVT in some studies is as high as 10%. Um, I think actually an acceptable below the knee DVT rate is probably two to 4%. But as I said, most of these DVTs are clinically insignificant. It can be managed with serial sonos. Clinically significant DVTs probably should be less than 1%. Um, to help reduce uh, the risk of DVT, you can elevate the limb prior to injection like we did in that video. You can use a low volume of solution. Uh, you should know where your perforators are. And if you see some of the solution going into the perforator, you should stop injecting. Um, you can apply digital pressure to the perforators. Uh, and then lastly, dorsiflexion of the ankle after injection can also help uh, dilute any of the solution that enters the deep system and reduce your risk of DVT. Another um, complication we see is thrombophlebitis. It's been reported in up to 15% of patients after treatment with varathena. I personally don't see this much in the literature. Um, they recommend compression therapy after uh, varathena for 48 hours. Um, they um, use a focal compression with padding and then uh, ACE wrap over that. And then they recommend two weeks of stockings. Um, after Varathena treatment of the GSV, I usually use uh, either the padding directly on the skin or um, I'll use uh, a bunch of uh, four by fours along the GSV, especially if some of the solution enters some of the, the tributaries. Instead of using that focal padding, I kind of pad the whole uh, lower leg as best as possible and then wrap with a, with a ACE wrap. I typically have them keep the ACE wrap on for 24 hours, take it off the next day, and then recommend stockings uh, for three to seven days. Um, with uh, any chemical ablation, delayed vein closure and its associated inflammation is going to occur. So I see um, Inflammation after uh, foam or varathena that develops two, four, six, even eight weeks post procedure. So I try and promote stocking use as long as possible after chemical ablation. The compression helps the vein close, but it also minimizes the inflammation when the vein closes. And less inflammation means less patient discomfort. Um, patients that cannot tolerate prolonged stocking use, 
I, I tell them to expect delayed inflammation even two months um, after, the in, after the injection. Uh, for uh, physician compounded foam, patients can develop side effects, including migraine headaches, neurological migraines, chest pressure, coughing, and wheezing. In rare cases, syncope, TIA, and strokes have been reported. Uh, for patient compounded foam, you know, don't use more than 10 cc's per day uh, to help avoid some of these complications. If you see some of the, the migraines, coughing spells, chest pressure, if you watch these patients for 20 to 30 minutes, um, um, outside of the migraines, the chest pressure, the coughing, the, um, the lightheadedness uh, seems to, to get better and it's self-limiting. Lastly, uh, please realize you need to visualize your needle tip when injecting any foam, uh, whether it's uh, physician compounded foam or Varathena, arterial, in, arterial injections can cause ulcerations and potentially uh, more severe consequences. Now, MOCA is a modality that CVR as a group has moved away from after uh, inferior closure rates, uh, occasional patient dissatisfaction due to discomfort during the procedure, and the higher risk of DVT than published. But uh, I always had good success with it, and it can absolutely be a modality to consider. So Venusil, uh, it's quickly becoming a preferred method of venous closure. Uh, it's one stick, no need for stockings post-procedure. Long-term closure rates are excellent, and there is less incidence of hypersensitivity reactions if resheathing is done. So a few words of caution with venous seal. Uh, if you access distally, you can actually cause significant ankle swelling just from the trauma of inserting the seven French introducer, especially in thin patients that, um, uh, you know, I see this and um, with the glue implants, if you have a superficial or a very thin patient, they actually may permanently feel some of the glue implants. So just one thing to consider. Um, in thinner patients or more superficial GSVs, um, if I'm using uh, venous seal, I often access at the distal aspect of the gastroc, like an RF procedure, and then I still foam the distal um, GSV segment. Um, remember, if you're going to use uh, venous seal, you, because you're using the introducer, you need about 10 centimeters of vein to safely use the venous seal. Um, Lastly, if you do encounter a hypersensitivity reaction, you can treat with NSAIDs, Benadryl, and even steroids. Um, venous seal is not for everyone. Um, there's insurance limitations, uh, of course, tortuous below the knee GSVs. Patients with latex allergies or multiple allergies, you may want to avoid this. Thin patients or superficial GSVs, as we just mentioned, need to be considered, but it's a great modality uh, to use when appropriate. Basically, everything we discussed regarding treatments of below the knee GSV disease can be applied to treating the SSV below um, the knee. Uh, closure rates tend to mirror closure rates for GSV closure. Uh, thermal modalities carry the same risk for nerve injury when treating the uh, SSV. Like the GSV, we have... Uh, Areas uh, that are more susceptible to nerve injury close to the knee and the distal leg are susceptible areas when treating the SSV with thermal modalities. Tibial nerve injuries can result in club foot and sural nerve injuries can result in paresthesias near the ankle. So again, the safe zone for thermal ablation of the SSV is similar to the GSV. I feel it's along the span of the gastroc. Now, nerve injury has seen up to 10% of patients after RF ablation of the SSV in some studies, but RF uh, ablation remains the most common modality of treatment for the SSV. Uh, it's superior to ultrasound-guided foam due to the poor long-term closure rates with physician-compounded foam. It's sometimes the only option due to insurance uh, criteria, but consider our other non-thermal uh, technologies, if permitted by insurance, like Varathena. This is especially useful for tortuous vessels, uh, vessels that have recannulized, where there may be webbing or P-throm um, throm present, and also where there's distal segmental disease. Again, venous seal uh, can be used if there's 10 centimeters of uh, straight vein present, and mocha can, all be, um, can be also safe.
here's a video of an RF ablation of the SSV with distal foam injection. The access site is uh, just above the distal aspect of the gastroc. The reflux here involved the whole SSV from the ankle to the popliteal area. We'll access the vein, insert a guide wire. When I make um, my nick of the skin, I, I, I kind of use, I use the needle to stabilize the scalpel, which you'll see. I find it's a little easier. And then I'll remove the needle of the dilator and introducer is inserted. So we'll insert the RF catheter. You can lock the, uh, the position. Since this is a smaller segment, uh, we hand to mess So we'll hand to mess, try to get good separation of that, of the fascia. Two cycles of heat uh, was applied to the SSV in this case. And then we'll, uh, a distal foam injection using a 27 gauge butterfly and 0.5% polydocanol was done to treat that distal segment. So we'll move away from axial vein treatment and we'll discuss treating below the knee tributaries and varicosities now. Um, many choices exist, but all have advantages and disadvantages. Low knee tributary disease can be treated using thermal modalities for sizable tributaries if permitted by insurance. However, the more common methods of treatment include chemical ablation and ambulatory phlebectomy. Chemical ablation includes both ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy and verithena. With these chemical ablation modalities, we can treat multiple areas, branching vessels, and also superficial disease safely but we must consider vessel size, long-term closure rates, and insurance limitations. Um, ambulatory phlebectomy here is very effective as well. Um, it's usually permitted by all insurances, but it can be painful and result in scarring, so we have to be careful. Also, nerve and lymphatic uh, injuries uh, can occur. Let's start by looking at laser for tributary disease. Uh, so, we have certain insurances in Maryland that it's, it's true, but they do not approve any form of sclerotherapy for tributary disease. And our only uh, choice for tributary treatment is laser or uh, phlebectomy. So this is an option also for patients with allergies to STS or polydocanol, or have had you know, bad reactions uh, to sclerosis in the past. Um, I usually cannulate these tributary veins with a 16 gauge needle, place the laser fiber through the needle because um, it's hard to get a, a full introducer into some of the, the, the um, tr smaller tributaries. Laser uh, closure of multiple segments of a disease tributary can actually provide definitive treatment with closure rates equal to thermal treatments of axial veins. Um, obviously we're limited here by vein anatomy um, it's not my first choice, uh, but you can make it work. It's more common that we're limited to the opposite, to a foam sclerotherapy injection or phlebectomy for tributary and varicose vein disease. Well, when it comes to foam sclerotherapy, it's effective, especially for medium-sized tributaries in the range of three to five millimeters. Um, 
Good long-term closure rates uh, sometimes require secondary injections. Um, but a few quick injections every year can be considered a success for patients as long as it keeps their legs feeling good. All right, so here's a video of ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Perforators are marked. Uh, we're going to mix 0.5% uh, polydocanol with CO2 and then using a 27 gauge butterfly into the posterior leg tributaries. Here is shown. This patient was having a lot of nocturnal cramping and focal achiness um, in their calf. Then again, you want to follow the foam. And if you see it going into any perforators like that, you just want to stop your injection. So Verathena versus foam. I prefer the versatility of Verathena um, if I can use it. It has the same benefits to foam, has the ability to close larger tributaries and varicosities and with less risk of side effects. Um, when you're treating larger vessels, even if effective, you do run the risk of phlebitis. With chemical closure, patients are more dependent on stocking use for a prolonged period of time to aid in the closure and also to minimize subsequent inflammation. And there's a cost of Verathena and also the 30-day shelf life to consider, but it's my preferred method for treating tributary disease if permitted by insurance. Um, I even use it for varic uh, varicosities in place of phlebectomy if patients are needle phobic. Some Verathena pearls, max dose of Verathena is up to 15 cc's of uh, solution compared to 10 cc's of physician compounded foam. So you can get a lot done. Um, also, when I use Verathena, I tend to start uh, the injections as distally as possible because it tends to flow anterograde. Whereas my experience with foam sclerotherapy, the physician uh, compounded foam sclerotherapy, um, it, it, with injection, it tends to go both um, retrograde and anterograde. So the area that I inject doesn't have to be um, as strategic. So in this video, uh, we're going to treat tributary disease with Verathena using a 25 gauge butterfly. So this is a larger bore butterfly than we use with the physician. Um, the patient's leg is elevated. Perforator vessels are marked. And we'll inject two sites here, a non-saphenous anterior trib and a proximal medial calf saphenous trib. I use approximately three cc's of Verathena um, with each injection. Ambulatory phlebectomy. Uh, I prefer performing my phlebectomies with an ablation at the same sitting. Um, it's been shown to improve quality of life measures more quickly than staging treatment. It also reduces the need for reintervention. In my experience, it also reduces the risk for developing phlebitis um, if you don't wait. Um, and the, also, the patients tend to be extremely satisfied not to see their varicosities, even if they're beaten and bruised. I know staging flebs may be favorable for reimbursement, and in some cases, you end up needing less, extent, uh, less extensive phlebectomy if you stage. So I see both sides of the, of the argument. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer um, at this point. Uh, over the years, I've treated patients with recurrent varicosities, or I've inherited patients with varicose veins that were never treated because varicosities were located laterally or over bony prominences. Lateral leg varicosities are usually fed by an anterior accessory vein, a lateral perforator, or even from a pelvic source. The reason lateral phlebectomies were avoided was due to the risk of perineal nerve injury, since the perineal nerve runs lateral and superficial, just distal to the knee. I have a performed lateral leg phlebectomy is uncomfortable with it, but you know, you do have to be um, cautious because with perineal nerve injury it can actually lead to, to foot drop. Now, this is my recipe for minimizing pain with phlebectomies. Um, also this limiting, this limits really uh, post uh, phlebectomy bleeding 
and bruising, and it addresses uh, varicosities over bony structures. The um, varicosities are marked when the patient is standing by outlining the vein. I don't like to puncture the skin through the marker just to avoid any potential tattooing. All patients are placed in some degree of Trendelenburg positioning. This drains the vein. It helps prevent bleeding um, during and after the procedure. I also foam the varicosities, which further displaces the blood, spasms the vein. And as a result, the patient is less likely to bleed and it reduces bruising. Then I typically an uh, anesthetize the skin. I add then cold uh, tumescent fluid, which further reduces bleeding and bruising, helps prevent discomfort during the procedure. Um, and it, with the tumescent, it can elevate any varicosity off of any bony structure. This uh, kind of recipe allows me to uh, um, have a less painful experience for the patient. Lastly, I tend to use a 16 gauge needle to puncture the skin rather than a scalpel. So I uh, I don't, I want to try to avoid any railroading uh, or scarring from the scalpel. If I scar with the 16 gauge needle, it looks more like a, um, more like a, a just a freckle uh, rather than a surgical scar. And then I'll, I'll use a hook to hook the vein out to, ses, uh, to successfully interrupt the varicosity. I try to do all of this as quickly as possible and return the patient to ambulatory status to reduce the risk for DVTs especially if I'm doing a phlebectomy in the same sitting as, as an ablation. Here's an example of everything we just spoke about. Um, the varicosities have all, already been foamed. Uh, we're just uh, administrating the lidocaine. We'll add tumescent fluid, and this kind of floats the, the vein in the tumescent fluid and it's great for elevating the vein off of any underlying bony structures like the shin, the ankle, the knee. And then we'll just hook, expose some of the, the vein and interrupt it. So here we just use the 16 gauge needle to puncture the skin. It's nice too with foaming uh, first. If I don't, I don't have to spend you know a long time. If I if I can't locate one of the varicosities, I can I can just move on and still have confidence that this vein is is adequately treated. And a lot of times you don't need a, you know, you don't need to, it's nice if you can pull out a large segment of the vein, um, but uh, just doing the interruption is, is adequate. And here we just do a simple interruption over the, the bony structure. So in treating TRIVs and varicosities, um, I prefer chemical over thermal ablation. I prefer Varathena over physician compounded foam. But go out of my way to emphasize prolonged stocking use, frequent ambulation, and the expectation of delayed inflammation that can develop even four, six, eight weeks out. For large visual varicosities, I prefer phlebectomy over Varathena. Overall, it's less risk for DVT, phlebitis, and skin uh, staining. So my treatment choice for foot varicosities is phlebectomy over chemical ablation. Dorsal foot varicosities can be common. They can be painful with, um, uh, with certain footwear. I know a lot of women come in and say that their sandals rub on, on this varicosity and it's, it's quite painful. And obviously they can be unsightly. Uh, phlebectomy has proven to be a safe choice in treating foot varicosities. In a 2018 study published in the journal Phlebology, uh, phlebectomy was performed on 188 feet with varicosities. The two most frequent complications post-procedure were edema and transient paresthesia, which all but one case resolved within three months. 
Now, one thing, if you encounter what looks like a foot varicosity in an unusual uh, place in the foot, like laterally or in the plantar surface of the foot, uh, think AVMs. Um, I've picked up a few AVMs uh, in, this, in these scenarios. Medial foot varicosities can be caused, can be a cause, I should say, of tarsal tunnel syndrome where venous congestion causes dilation of the posterior tibial vein, which increases pressure on all structures running under the flexor, uh, flexor retinaculum, causing foot pain, numbness, and weakness uh, with toe flexion. Um, approximately 4% of tarsal tunnel syndrome causes are from varicose veins. Patients present with um, on and off pain and numbness involving the plantar surface of the foot, Symptoms are precipitated by anything that exacerbates varicose vein dilation, like taking a hot bath or shower or after exercise. Patients encounter symptoms more frequently at the end of the day or at rest. And if we do an ankle MRI, this can confirm the diagnosis. In order to achieve good treatment results with tarsal tunnel syndrome, the vascular abnormalities need to be addressed any foot deformities need to be corrected if present, and the, a tarsal tunnel decompression is probably uh, needed as well. So you'll have to get your podiatrist involved. Lastly, below um, knee perforator disease, um, it's a common cause of recurrent venous disease, focal pain, swelling, and ulcerations. Both thermal and chemical modalities are effective at addressing pathological perforators, which are defined as perforators with a diameter of 3.5 millimeters or greater, and a reflux time over 0.5 uh, seconds. Indications to treat these pathological perforators are listed here, ulcers, uh, focal pain and swelling, lateral varicosities, um, but be aware arteries run beside perforator vessels in many cases. So um, keep that in mind when, you, when it comes to treatment. Due to the pinpoint accuracy that is required to close a perforator vessel using an RFS stylet or a laser fiber, closure rates are slightly lower with thermal modalities than with chemical modalities. So don't be shy to try uh, foam or varathena, especially if you have a distal or mid-calf uh, perforator. Um, use low volumes of sclerosant. Uh, return the patient to ambulatory status as soon as possible. Um, in my experience, if you do uh, get a small DVT in the distal or mid area of the calf, these tend to be small segmental clots, and they uh, tend to resolve without treatment and do not cause uh, PEs or post-thrombotic syndrome in my experience. And uh, that concludes uh, my talk this morning. So I appreciate everybody tuning in. If you have any questions uh, or you want to discuss anything further? This is time. So thank you, Sean. I mean, that was a, a really comprehensive talk, but I have a ton of questions that I'd like to ask just because I have difficulties with a lot of these decision-making trees. So can, let's talk a little bit about Varathena. So I have had um, very variable responses with Varathena in terms of the post-operative pain. And so what I got from your talk is that after our bandaging, you really um, impress upon the patients that they need to wear compression stockings for several days. Now, I have to tell you, I don't do that. And I'm wondering now, listening to your talk, whether or not a lot of that intense inflammatory reaction, and it's mostly in the baloney segment, right? The baloney GSP, when I inject it with Varathena, they have a lot of post-operative discomfort. So is that in your experience as well when they don't wear the compression stockings afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when, as you guys know, when a vein closes, your body doesn't recognize a doctor closed your vein. So your body responds as if it was injured. So with any vein closure, you're going to get inflammation. With um, the modality, thermal modalities, that inflammation is immediate since the vein closure is immediate. But with these with these injections, you're going to have off and on inflammation as the different size vessels close over time. And um, if you're treating below the knee segments, you're going to get focal inflammation, but also 
all that inflammation is going to get pulled down due to gravity. And you're going to get a lot of, you're going to get swelling in the foot and ankle tightness and pain, uh, in the ankle, which we may perceive like a throbbing discomfort. So anything we can do to minimize the inflammatory response over time is going to be helpful. And, um, I think some ways to minimize that inflammatory response is by prolonged compression. So I really, I really emphasize um, that they need to, to be in some compression uh, as long as tolerated. It's going to, it's going to help them. And this, the other, the other I, I thing, a lot yeah. of people get a lot of phlebitis after uh, foam and barathena, and I rarely see it. And I, I, I use it extremely, um, you know, often. Yeah. The other thing that I think, uh, and this is particularly for the fellows with Verathena, when it first came out, I was not following the IFU and my closure rates were not good. So it is important to, you know, elevate the leg before you proceed, exsanguinate the blood, wait the four to five minutes, you know, then put your catheter in, give small volumes, let it go into spasm. You may need to puncture twice. And then the, uh, the, the banana roll or whatever the hell that thing's called, it does make a difference. So uh, I have to say, it, it, uh, once I started following the IFU, the results changed and the closure rates got better and it's a better modality. So sometimes when you think you may know better, you don't. And that's the, the take home message for that. But, you know, Sean, can you just mention also, since you do use a lot of foam, one of my biggest concerns about foaming, say larger, larger veins, three millimeters or bigger is the staining. Do you see a lot of staining? And if not, how do you um, prevent that? Because I'm very concerned about staining with foam in larger veins. Yeah, so for the uh, amount of foaming I do, um, I don't see a whole lot of staining, but there's definitely skin types you have to be concerned with. Um, and it's, it, you know, in literature, they say with foam, you're going to get staining in one out of three patients. I don't see it as that, that much. But I, I do see it in, especially in um, the higher Fitzpatrick uh, skin type. So just, just be aware. Again, I think prolonged. So one thing is, is the, I do the procedures as quickly as possible and then return them to ambulatory status as, as quickly as possible. So do the injection, uh, instantly uh, compress the vein with, with your ACE wrap. When I, when I, um, prior to wrapping them, when I do ultrasound guided foam, I'll, instead of using, um, you know, like cotton balls or, or wadded up four by fours, I, I kind of compress the whole calf with, uh, laying the four by fours flat because when you foam, you kind of get into all the branches. So that, that area that you're covering is, is pretty extensive. And I think compressing as much of that as possible is, is a key. And then getting them back to ambulatory um, status and then prolonged compression, I think has really reduced the, the need for, um, you know, thrombo uh, phlebectomies as well as um, I, I see less staining. And what about trap blood, Sean? Do you seeing a lot of that with your foaming? Because I noticed in the video that you showed and Ken and, Ken and I have had this discussion, you're foaming them. And in some of them, the larger varicosities, you're just phlebectomizing them. So do you see a lot of trapped blood with no, with foam? no, I don't see a whole lot of trapped blood. And again, I, maybe it's cause I put almost everybody in Trendelenburg positioning. So I drain the vein. Um, sometimes it can make, um, you know, accessing the vein a little bit more difficult. Um, but, um, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of staining. I don't see a whole lot of trapped blood. And I, the only thing I can think of is draining the, the vein, injecting quickly, wrapping them up immediately and then get them walking. Yeah. And finally, my last question is in regards to foot veins. So I was very you know, interested to see that study that you popped up because my own personal experience with foot veins has been very bad. Whenever I do a phlebectomy, either close to the ankle or near the, near the dorsum of the foot, they're always in a lot of pain. They're always have a lot of swelling. They're never happy. Now, maybe that's because I'm only seeing them in the immediate post-operative period, and I don't look at them three, four months later like that study you showed, but I'm right. very, very reticent to do anything about foot veins. Yeah, I, I try to discourage patients and just tell them the reason they're seeing that vein is because there's nowhere for it to hide, right? It's over a bunch of, you know, bony prominences with with not, le not a lot of soft uh, um, tissue. So 
I agree, uh, Peter, right afterwards, it's almost like a love hate relationship. They're probably going to hate you right afterwards, but yep. they're very, very satisfied, um, at, you know, after they heal, just, just again, be careful with, um, there's a lot of other structures, uh, tendons and nerves in the foot. So I, I do tend to use that technique where I to mess and kind of float the vein up off of uh, the dorsum of the foot or off of the ankle bone as best as possible and um, go in very shallow with my hook. And you don't need to take out a lot of the vein. It's more of a, I just more of do a vein interruption in these, um, in these cases. And um, it, it I've, I've knock on wood, I've, I've been pretty fortunate. Yeah. Anybody else have any questions for Sean? This was a really comprehensive and great talk. I hope everybody paid attention to this, especially the fellows. Thank Mohammed, you. Do you have a question? I have two questions. This, uh, this is Mohammed. Thank you, Sean, for the talk. Um, just have a couple of questions regarding uh, first question regarding the insurance. How they do? How do they perceive us retreating the below knee segment uh, with Veritina, or, uh, especially with Veritina? Uh, if the first treatment fail and how many times can you just, you know, resubmit for treatment, especially in patients who have you know, CEP4 and above disease? Yeah, so I, I haven't seen any um, LCD declare a uh, limitation um, uh, to, to subsequent treatments, at, a, at least in my area. So um, I've been able to, you, you know, treat multiple times. There is always going to be some uh, percent of treatment failure that we have to keep in mind, no matter if we do everything perfectly. We do see more treatment failures in patients that are non-compliant with post-procedure compression. So that's something you guys need to stress. The other thing is, is with uh, foam or Verathena, even at one month, you may have, um, you know, uh, the vessel may be still open. It may not be as refluxing. It may not be symptomatic. Uh, so keep in mind that you may get delayed closures even after one month with, with modalities like Verathena. So patience sometimes is, is important. Um, but from an insurance perspective, I think they know that, you, you know, there's failure rates and there's also, this is a chronic issue. Uh, so I haven't seen any limitations on re repeated treatments. Okay. And, and my second question regarding uh, venous seal. Uh, how do you prevent or, or, or what do you do if the glue went to the tributaries, especially the bigger ones? Um, uh, yeah, so if the glue goes into the tributaries, you know, I'm not too concerned about that, to be honest. It, it actually, you know, may be beneficial um, in preventing you know, recurrence and, and new areas from developing. The only thing that you would have to worry about is if those tributaries, if that glue travels really superficially to now where they can, you know, feel that glue. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't have a good answer for you in, in, in those, in that case. Um, I think it may be difficult to surgically remove that. I don't know if anybody else has any uh, input on that. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely hard to remove surgically, and it's definitely uh, it's not it's not like uh, foam where you can maybe drain some of the trapped blood. So I was wondering how uh, does everyone deal with the glue uh, going to the very very superficial tributaries? Ken, do you have a question? So Mohammed, I, I think that you can do a a, a saphenectomy, and you can do a a uh, a uh, tributary uh, phlebectomy uh, after glue. That's that's usually done after obviously extreme circumstances. Patients that have severe reactions after uh, after uh, uh, venous seal procedures, and obviously if you tried steroids, you tried everything, and months and months. I think I've uh, I know of one one patient that was sent to us from another vein practice that wanted up having a patient uh, with severe, I think Frank Sobraco had a patient that was sent to him that had a bad reaction after um, venous seal and wanted up having to have a uh, saphenectomy, which resolved her symptoms. But um, it, it can be removed, but it would have to be done under, under anesthesia. And it, it... Mm-hmm. 
All right. Anybody else have a question for Sean? All right. Thank you very much, Sean. Fantastic talk. Thank you. That was really, really, really high quality. I appreciate all the effort you put into that. All right, everybody. Thank have you. a great weekend. All right, thank you, guys.